Welcome everybody to um, this session of the seminar series of the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance in Canberra. This is the sixth sem seminar of the Decolonizing Deliberative Democracy series. I'm really excited about this one. It's going to be on decolonizing deliberative mini publics. So one of the core topics that we're talking about. Um, it is 6 p.m. in Canberra. It's 10 p.m. in Berlin in, in uh, Central Europe where um, Asusena, one of our speakers, is where I am as well. So we're all in different places. Um, for our home institution, the University of Canberra, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Canberra, the Nanawal people. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. And of course, we can all reflect wherever we are on the people who were there before us and what they have contributed to um, the region and the, the culture that we're part of now. So I'm briefly going to introduce the speakers um, and then hand over to them. Asusena Moran is a research associate at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany, where she was colleague, colleague with me um, for a while. Um, she's also a PhD candidate at the University of Potsdam. Her work explores deliberative and participatory responses to planetary challenges and draws on theories of decoloniality, political oppression, and governance in areas of limited statehood. Now, Nicole Karat, of course, in our circle needs little introduction or no introduction, actually, but for everybody else who's joining, Nicole Corato is a professor of political sociology at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance in Canberra. Her research areas include deliberative democracy, Philippine politics, and research methods. Her work examines democratic innovations in the aftermath, aftermath of tragedies such as disasters, armed conflict, and urban crime. And her most recent book on this very topic is Democracy in a Time of Misery by Oxford University Press. So um, as a and Nicole, we're so excited to have you here and I'm handing over to you. All right, well, uh, thank you, Hans. So I think we'd like to begin our presentation by paying respects um, to Ned Crosby. Our colleague, Lynn Carson, or Carson, just announced that Ned uh, passed away. And for all of us who know um, the work of Ned, he is the founder of Citizens Juries. And Ned was a trailblazer uh, in the field of deliberative practice. And I think it's important to pay respects uh, to, to Ned because it seems that our presentation may sound overly critical of deliberative mini publics. But I think the premise is we've only reached this point that we are able to become self-critical and self-aware of the issues surrounding deliberative mini publics because our field um, has been so blessed to have uh, tireless visionaries like Ned, who devoted his time and his resources to experiment on how uh, democracies can be um, improved. So I think the premise of our presentation is that there is a lot of respect and a lot of appreciation for the work of Ned and our colleagues in the field in advancing our uh, practice and our research on deliberative mini publics. So let me just um, share my screen for our presentation. All right. So we'd like to uh, begin by our presentation by saying that we are aware that the, that the decolonizing agenda, whether it's decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing political science, or decolonizing deliberative democracy, has brought discomfort to some people. So some argue, albeit informally, that the decolonizing agenda is too aggressive or too accusatory, that, ex that it exaggerates differences or exaggerates grievances or makes false dichotomies. And we fully recognize these sentiments. Decolonization is not meant to be comfortable. A big part of it is recognizing the unpleasant histories of knowledge production that have sustained academic research including the theory and practice of deliberative democracy. And we have two key messages or puzzles in this presentation. First, we want to make a case for decolonizing deliberative democracy. We argue that deliberative democracy in its dominant theoretical construction and empirical practice 
is complicit to maintaining the privileges of white Western democratic theory and practice. We place emphasis on the term dominant, dominant theoretical construction and empirical practice, because we do not deny the possibility that there are practices of deliberative democracy that are decolonial, it's just that they are not dominant in our understanding of the deliberative uh, democracy as a field of study. Second, we would like to explore how the colonial construction of deliberative democracy maps on the practice of deliberative mini publics. We argue that the design features of mini publics, despite good intentions, further entrench dominant epistemologies that maintain today's global racial order. I think the caveat here is we do not hate mini publics. As Usena and I have run, studied, evaluated mini publics ourselves. But we consider this presentation as a challenge for us to understand what we've been doing from a decolonial perspective. So what do we mean when we say we need to decolonize deliberative democracy? What makes it a colonial practice in the first place? So when we say we need to decolonize deliberative democracy, we mean three things. First, to decolonize deliberative democracy, we need to radically question our theoretical foundations and overcome our color blindness. So for many of us, including myself, our entry point to the study of deliberative democracy is through the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. And despite this school of thought's critique against domination, the Frankfurt School, as Edward Said argues, is stunningly silent on racist theory, anti-imperialist resistance, and oppositional practice in the empire. This silence, he argues, is not a mere oversight, but a motivated silence. So when we think about the remnants of colonial oppression, such as today's racial order, we see that racism in political theory is often portrayed as anomalous or a mysterious deviation from the European Enlightenment humanism. And so when we think about racism in relation to deliberative theory, one could easily say that racism is a distortion of the ideal public sphere because it is against the ideal of equality. So a racist deliberative democracy is not deliberative democracy at all, one might argue. It's fair to say that, but it's only fair to say that only if we think that theories can and should be abstracted from the context in which they are developed. And we take the position that they cannot and should not be abstracted from the contexts in which they were developed. We think abstraction is a way of obscuring power relations. Instead, we argue that what we need to do is to historicize the abstract principles of deliberative democracy that we have come to use today. So if we examine the critical historiographies of European modernity, it becomes apparent that colonial oppression was a precondition for Enlightenment ideals to emerge. In other words, colonialism and the continuation of colonial oppression are not anomalies, but they are foundational to the European Enlightenment thought on which deliberative democracy is based. So take the case of reason, a foundational concept in deliberative democracy. In the theory of communicative action, volume two, Habermas described the emergence of European modernity as the development towards rationality. Reason prevails when sacred knowledge is replaced by knowledge based on the rational adjudication of validity claims. For Amy Allen, whose book you see on the screen, there is a teleological narrative embedded in that claim. It portrays Europe as an agent of progress. It sets the European path of development as a normative standard for progress, while non-European cultures were considered pre-modern, therefore irrational. To argue based on scientific evidence is principle is better than arguing based on religious beliefs and custom, according to this view of progress. So for critical race scholars, the distinction between modern and primitive serves as a de facto color line. It separates the West from others, which was used as basis for the colonial project. And this argument, I suppose, is familiar to many of us. Modernity, as Serene Kader puts it, played a justificatory role in imperialism by fueling Westerners sense that others need to be economically, militarily, and culturally colonized. Enlightenment thinkers were not accidental, but they were central players to the colonial project. 
Kant, for example, advanced the color-coded racial hierarchy of Europeans, Asians, Africans, and Native Americans, whom he differentiated based on their degree of innate talent and consequently a reflection of their unchangeable moral quality. Kant endorsed and justified European colonialism until the early 1790s, until he developed a cosmopolitan and egalitarian relationship among peoples in his later work. The state of nature that Hobbes described as one where life is nasty, brutish, and short was identified to the savage people in many places of America, according to Hobbes. Even British suffragists, suffragists thought that India needed to be ruled because they cloistered their women. And this is based on the view that societal progress means women's incorporation into a gender neutral public sphere. Finally, the United States Declaration of Independence, which claimed that all men were created equal, had an implicit caveat. Non-Europeans were not created equal because they were not considered people in the first place. They were primitive. So why do we raise these examples? We raise these examples to make an emphatic point that the canons on which deliberative democracy is built and stands on are based on white settler state ideology and are complicit with the resurgence of colonial forms of oppression. It's an ideology responsible for the conceptual erasure of societies that have existed long before colonialism, societies that were considered primitive and therefore not fully fledged people. It's an ideology that uses Europe as the main referent for progress or modernity, or Europe as a guiding point for where the world is headed. That's the teleological aspect of European modernity as benchmark for progress. So you might say that this may have happened a long time ago, but we can argue that the legacy lingers today. In our own exercise of critical self-reflection, we ask ourselves as authors of this paper the following questions. Where do we get the audacity to say that deliberative democracy is a superior normative ideal? Where do we get the confidence to say that we should work towards promoting deliberative democracy around the world? Why are we so bold in claiming that the future of democracy is deliberative democracy? Why are we fascinated by the deliberative wave happening in OECD countries, anticipating that maybe in the future, the rest of the world will catch up to? catch up being in scare quotes. Isn't the boldness of our vision as deliberative Democrats a legacy of the Eurocentric teleological account of progress, a continuation of the story that we are modern and they are primitive? Now, one might wonder, isn't that too critical? Isn't it enough that we recognize the racism of political theorists from Enlightenment? Isn't it enough that we say we live in a different time and we think Kant, Hobbes, and Habermas had blind spots and that these men were products of their time? Isn't it enough that we start recognizing the plurality of deliberative cultures? Isn't it enough that we map the diversity of speech styles that can be considered deliberative like testimonies, humor, nonverbal communication, and others? Isn't it sufficient to state our positionality as we form relationships with Global South scholars? Isn't it enough that we say we are engaged in academic discourse with, um, with other academics from the perspective of white academy? Isn't that enough? The answer is no. We cannot just reset deliberative theory and we can't just say we are more inclusive now and forget our foundations, racist histories, colonial legacies, and current complicities. This leads us to our second point. To, deliber to, to, democ sorry, to decolonize deliberative democracy is to make imperialism visible in our intellectual history that continues to shape practice today. To decolonize deliberative democracy is to recognize that the field's roots in European modernity were developed based on the colonial subjugation of others. The point is to challenge erasure and evasion as epistemic norms. So to render imperialism visible in the theory of democracy, we propose that we should first recognize that our much valued principles of freedom, reason, and societal progress were underwritten by an economic system 
based on the enslavement of non-European labor and the extermination of indigenous people. We take inspiration from the work of Charles Mills and argue that we cannot treat deliberative democracy as a neutral baseline, as if nothing happened before. We cannot just say that we now recognize the equality of non-white people and we recognize deliberative cultures practiced outside the West without critically interrogating the extent to which deliberative democracy has been implicated in maintaining the current racial order. So a decolonial deliberative theory, therefore, does not just say that deliberative democracy is a pluralistic field of study that recognizes deliberative cultures in places like Guatemala. A decolonial deliberative theory argues that deliberative culture that, emer that emerged in English coffee houses and French salons where anyone from all walks of life can engage in critical discourse was actually made possible by the consolidation of new forms of colonial domination through land grabbing and forced labor in Guatemala's coffee plantations and coffee dictatorships. That is why there was a public sphere there, because there was a colonialist practice happening elsewhere. And the same is true in contemporary times. We can say that social media is a public sphere in the contemporary times, but we cannot erase the fact that social media platforms like Facebook are actually, in a way, a civilized public sphere because there are underpaid content moderators working in the global south to sanitize social media from hate speech, extreme speech, and incitement to violence. So that is what we mean by not erasing imperialism and extractive practices as part of our colonial history. We foreground it rather than evading the story by saying we are all equal now. This leads us to our third point. To decolonize deliberative democracy is to borrow Robert Schillam's arguments to recontextualize, reconceptualize, and reimagine deliberative democracy. We need, to reconcept, we need to recontextualize deliberative democracy's foundation. And there is an easy way to do this. So to paraphrase Shilam, we can simply look for the most exotic forms of deliberation around the world and appreciate their uniqueness. But when we do this, we just shift our focus in studying the margins while leaving the center intact. What made these practices marginal and exotic and what sustains deliberative practice in Europe to remain at the center. This is also why we need to reconceptualize deliberative democracy. As David Scott argues, we as scholars trained in the European and Euro-American tradition have the responsibility to unlearn our taken for granted privileges and learn to think inside the moral languages of our historical others. And it's not an accident that we find it challenging to find authors that challenge deliberative democracy's canons, because for Charles Mills, the answer is simple but disturbing. And that is because imperial centers talk to colonial margins, but rarely listens back to them. To decolonize deliberative democracy, therefore, is an invitation to create conceptual bridges between mainstream deliberative theory and indigenous and global South political thought. And in so doing, we can begin reimagining how deliberative democracy can be at the forefront of decolonization, including and most especially the repatriation of indigenous land and the recognition of deliberative autonomy and governance beyond or despite the nation state. So for this presentation, we focus on the locus of activity of deliberative democracy, which is deliberative mini publics. How do deliberative mini publics entrench dominant epistemologies and maintain today's racial and neo-colonial order? I'll continue here. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so as many of you know, could you change the slide, please? Thank you. So as many of you know, mini publics are carefully designed spaces that uh, want to engage a certain group of a population in what is supposed to be an open, inclusive, informed, and consequential deliberation. The idea of open mini publics has been put forward as a new form of governance for a post-representative era. Mini publics, in other words, are offered as an alternative to govern our contemporary societies. We believe that in order to reimagine the deliberative project as a future-oriented project, we need to understand and repair its colonial complicities, 
we decided to start this process with mini publics because of how much they've been studied, interpreted, and reproduced in the past years. And we want to answer this question by critically contextualizing some of the dominant design features of mini publics. We want to challenge their colonial histories, complicities, and dependencies. And we draw inspiration from decolonial thought, which analyzes the dominant discourses, institutions, and practices that enable the construction of Western democracy. We will do it as we think about new realities with authority and from exteriority, as Dussel would say. And this means understanding practices that occur outside the West and despite Western impositions. It means transforming the processes that do not allow us to imagine different futures. And today we will uh, specifically talk about the complicities of first, convening and embedding many publics in the nation state, second, selecting citizens and the making of publics, and third, the selection of expert evidence for the implementation of mini publics. Uh, so first, a lot of data and support have come, especially in the past 10 years from the Western world. First, to motivate politicians and administrators to convene these forms of deliberative governance. And second, to embed these deliberative mini publics in our institutions, laws, and regulations. But the idea to convene and embed deliberative mini publics is built, depends, and revolves on the unquestioned borders and the birth of the settler colonial nation states and its institutions. But as Aníbal Quijano and many others have said, while trying to understand the extent to which our current world is defined by colonialism, the mechanisms of colonial oppression did not go away with the emergence of independence movements and the birth of the nation former colonies. The current democratic administration of these territories is still historically and structurally dependent on the global coloniality of power. Fanon predicted how as territories became independent from colonial powers, they would inherit the colonial relations and forms of colonial oppression, as well as many of the borders violently and arbitrarily demarcated by Western powers during the Berlin Conference. The political philosopher Claude Aki traced the decisions of new African leaders as African countries became independent. He saw that the partnerships created with former colonial powers went against popular demands for redistribution, systemic transformation, and national consciousness. A national consciousness advocated by Fanon, yet criticized for following, as I yet says, Eurocentric grammar of exclusion and rigid boundary draw drawing. In Central America, nation states were built upon imaginaries that many argue do not reflect indigenous or Afro-descendants past, present, and future imaginaries. Colonial forms of oppression today are often carried out by assimilating indigenous communities into the imaginary of one nation state. The nation state for Pop Gael has been understood as a political fiction created by non-indigenous peoples, a nationalist rewriting of history that follows anti-Black and anti-indigenous traditions of erasure. In her book, An Us Without the State, the Mihi intellectual Yasnaya Aguilar Hill analyzes how the nation state constitutes an attempt to erase the different nations living in Mexico by denying and oppressing the autonomy and right to self-determination of indigenous communities. She argues that the category indigenous, a notion built in relationship to the nation state against the naming of different Mesoamerican nations, denies the present and the future of these communities. It erases 9,000 years of history and reduces them to the past 200 years of colonial oppression. It disarticulates the need for autonomous governance. Yet autonomous forms of deliberation happening outside or despite the nation state are in our field often referred to as an enclave deliberation, not compliant with the dominant design paradigms of many publics. Deliberation that happens among people deemed to be on the same side of the political debate in deeply divided societies is often dismissed as a threat to the nation state. Deliberation restricted to certain groups is not deemed democratic. It does not support the ideal of multicultural neoliberalism in nation states. However, in many cases, decolonial deliberative praxis demands that deliberation occurs despite or outside the idea of nation state. Spaces of deliberation put in place by indigenous communities in response, for instance, to large scale extractivism today, at times refuse to use the mechanisms of participation and deliberation offered by the nation state or international law. They implement autonomous spaces of deliberation, which are often later deemed constitutional by national governments, like the consultations of good faith in Guatemala. Uh, 
And some scholars had tried to explain this rejection of government-led forms of deliberation by outlining its design failures, its in their inaccessibility, and the need for citizenship to sometimes be mediated by NGOs. But in doing so, they sometimes also ignored the radical demands of some indigenous movements who refused altogether the regulation of these processes of deliberation. A workable agreement through state-led deliberation would force indigenous communities to give up deliberative autonomy, often in exchange for basic services uh, previously denied by the nation state. It would force them to reach a point of consensus, rendering negotiable, negotiable their demands for the restitution of collective land ownership. Other alternatives have been offered by the colonial praxis and scholarship. Analysis of Fanon's work called for a collective subject who can walk towards liberation throughout Africa, Asia, and the Americas, and avoid the political elites inheriting the models and borders of colonial oppression. Indigenous movements in Latin America, especially in Bolivia and Ecuador, have seek some deliberative autonomy, more deliberative autonomy, by developing a plurinational state. So by reimagining democracy with non-government-led forms of deliberation, we could avoid the colonial complicities of reducing deliberative mini-publics to processes owned by the nation state. This could mean understanding the costs that came with achieving a specific type of independence, the com compromises made with colonial powers, and other anti-colonial imaginaries that were not or not yet achieved. It could also mean refusing the need to achieve a workable agreement between indigenous communities whose land was stolen, transnational companies owned by former colonial and imperial powers, and the national elites who inherited colonial power through land grabbing and labor exploitation. Our second point regards the recruitment and the selection of participants in the liberative mini publics. So a lot has been said about making these spaces more inclusive and how to do this by bringing together a group of participants that is able to reflect the demography of the city or a country. Mini publics create a representative public via a process of random selection and demographic, demographic stratification. This is descriptive form of representation within the mini public assumes and relies on citizenship as an equalizing factor among participants. It is colorblind. In liberal multicultural societies, it ignores the links that connect educational attainment, postcodes, center periphery, labor practices, and property to racial, ethnic, cultural, and class classifications imposed during the colonial era and kept until today. And historiography can help us understand the settler colonial logic behind the creation of a controlled public sphere and the violence tied to the classification of non-white communities. Racial governance and racial categories were the mechanism to manage, exploit, and oppress enslaved and indentured non-whites. The evolution of property law during the Enlightenment was dependent on this colonial practice. Racial categories were used to justify the ability to own or not to own land in colonized territories, to be able to govern or not govern these territories, to exploit a series of lands and enrich certain groups while leaving others living in misery. Verna Bandar traces the legacy of categorization until today. It was the entanglement between land ownership and racial classifications during the transatlantic slave trade and the appropriation of indigenous lands that made colonial capitalism emerge. Old and new colonial classifications and legal rationales were and are still used to justify the appropriation of land and the co-optation of democratic institutions. Historical records show the extreme proliferation of racial categories imposed by colonial powers after the 15th century. In Nicaragua, historical archives in the 1820s signal up to 22 different racial classifications in place. People who are able or not to possess the land and govern based on their proximity to whiteness, to a culture, to a language, and to certain economic structures. Take the institutions of servitude that exist until now in the Americas. These were forced on indigenous women based on categorizations that define their freedom and their forms of labor, according to Kumis. So when independent movements came, the categorization of peoples became deeply tied to anti-Black and anti-Indigenous projects of miscegenation and nation building in Latin America, to the creation of what Rita Segato says is the uncertain race, non-white, non-Indigenous, non-Black, people without histories not alliances and cross-cultural intimacies, but nationalist, anti-Indigenous, anti-Black identities. 
a cultural homogenization that Quijano says raised the indigenous questions and the black question in order for somebody to survive within the borders of a nation state. The different colonial powers use racialist categorization differently to distribute land and liberty of autonomy. But generally, the idea of demarcating publics and territories through categorization became a dominant mechanism of, col of colonial governance. In former British colonies, characterized by the centralized forms of colonial oppression, the different ethnopolitical constituencies marked by the English define who inherited the state after independence. Studies on the colonial salary structures in Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya saw racial categorizations define how far African nation uh, communities could go within the government and how much they could earn. Racial categorizations, combined with a center periphery logic, define not only wage gaps, but also an economy based on the exploitation of the indigenous periphery to favor those living in the capital. Under Dutch rule, Different publics were created in Indonesia as the Gemini's elite, often offered a Western education, was conferred economic tax-related duties and power. And rural and outer islands were exploited to produce exportable tropical commodities. These created a classification between Javanese, outer island communities, and outer island Muslims that conferred them with specific jobs, educations, and geographies. Understanding identity against the hegemony of colonial classifications and years of violent oppression in Indonesia is, Benda describes it, as an agonizing, difficult adjustment. Stuart Hall expressed the same concern in his lecture, Negotiating Caribbean Identities. The trauma of identities formed as a consequence of colonization, indenture, and slavery forces communities to come to terms with many things, including the society that became independent from the colonial power. The ties between racial classifications, land grabbing, and the dispossession of the liberty of autonomy have an effect on today's complex identity formation in former colonies. But not only, they also have an effect on our ability to imagine new forms of democratic governance worldwide. Many publics can constitute a democratic renewal as long as they do not replicate the creation of microcosms that reflect the colonial dynamics of artificial public making and easy racial classifications that somehow hide behind and are deeply tied to material markers of difference, education, land ownership, postcodes. Instead of reproducing and tweaking violent forms of colonial governance, true democratic renewal should uplift the natural emergence of publics and the governments of emancipatory alliances between existing communities. It could resist easy racial classifications and engage in how different peoples marked by the different non-linear histories of colonial oppression, indentured labor, and slavery retell their stories, understand their identities, and build emancipatory alliances and publics. Third, we would like to turn to the selection um, and the presentation of expert evidence um, during mini publics, which is very much linked to a larger critique on what we consider universal logic, uh, universal knowledge. So Udi Bhatia explores the deliberative costs of excluding disadvantaged groups by mapping the obstacles that privileged communities would face if those communities were not present during the deliberation. His case against epistocracy has been well reflected in many publics, spaces in which collaborative governance become a response to epistemic avoidance, to the failure of recognizing oppression, hearing it, seeing it, deliberating on it. However, even though the need of including different forms of knowledge during the deliberations is very well present in the deliberative project, it is often not well reflected on the selection of expert evidence or in the research around many publics and other deliberative experiences. Since the enlightenment, Western attempts to criticize coloniality reflected the racial order imposed by colonial relations. Following this racial contract, the South beca became an exoticized, erotic, natural, static place in which European explorers could romantically venture. The characterization of the West against those who Fanon calls the wretch of the earth was not only a colonial division between our geographies, but a cognitive division of past and present, culture and nature, head and heart. So take for instance, the Rose review of the trip of Bougambi, in which he creates a dialogue between Otoru, a Tahitian man returning from Europe to, to, from Europe to Tahiti, um, in which they discuss how Tahitians won't believe Otoru when he explains the West to them. 
and I'm quoting here, I'm quite sure of it. The life of the savage is so simple and our societies are such complicated machines. The Titan is close to the origins of the world and the European near to its old age. The gulf between us is greater than the separating the newborn child from the decrepit daughter. The Tahitian either fails entirely to understand our customs and laws, or he sees them as nothing but fetters disguised in a hundred different ways, which can only inspire indignation and scorn in those for whom the love of liberty is the deepest of all feelings." End quote. So throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, the attempt of the West to rescue what he thought was obscure, alienated, strange, was criticized as essentialist, orientalist creations of knowledge, colonial forms of understanding. Kumis, while re reading Said, says that as essentialism rendered communities non-autonomous, static, rural, in the past, it built an autochthonous imaginary, an imaginary of the South, an imaginary of indigenous communities that sacrifice reality and the possibility to deliberate an alternative future. And the language of science and expert knowledge developed in parallel to the European expansion and the, European, and the colonial understanding of the world. The alleged universality that non-place and the colonial language of science had, to quote Castro Lopez, a specific place in the colonial map and served as a strategy to control subaltern populations. So selecting and relating to knowledge and knowledge producers in a way that responds to the complexity of contemporary societies can open the space for the actual deliberation of different futures. An alternative to expand what expert and universal knowledge is, but also how we select, translate, and relate to expertise as we design mini publics. Let me finish. So mini publics are often presented as spaces that guarantee governments certain corrective norms for communities marked by slavery, indentured labor, and colonial oppression. To incentivize uh, administrative and political actors to adopt and embed deliberate decision-making processes, advocates have argued that these mini publics, these processes are not meant to be spaces where citizens list grievances, grievances or wishes. But in doing so, they imply the impossibility of subversion of demands, of struggles. They imply the possibility of maintaining the status quo. Yet a conditional inclusion within the system, to paraphrase Segato and Kusikanki, an inclusion that doesn't give space to the historical demands of oppressed communities does not amplify possibilities of survival. It does not amplify, imply freedom from contemporary forms of colonial oppression. So how do we sit and approach the ambivalence, the complexity and the discomfort of colonial past and presence and the racial hierarchies within deliberative mini publics? What can deliberative democracy do in a democracy existing against the background of what Stuart Hall calls a colonial regime which ruptured and broke and recut and reorganized peoples and tribes and societies in a horrendous shakeup of their entire cognitive and social world? First, by creating deliberative spaces able to question the oppressive nature of the nation state and embed themselves in mechanisms of governance outside the government. Second, by designing mini publics that do not create artificial publics using easy classifications, but see and empower existing publics. Third, by questioning and relating to knowledge and its complexity as we share evidence and expertise in deliberative mini publics. These mini publics could trigger and lead to intimacies and solidarities, able to reinvent truly the way in which we govern ourselves and free ourselves from the global racial contract and other colonial forms of oppression and dispossession. Thank you.